Hello, and thank you for joining us for the SLW Institute webinar, Patenting Vaccines, a look back and the road ahead. Please feel free to submit any questions using the Q&A feature on the Zoom menu. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be emailed to all registrants. Our speakers today will be Robin Chadwick, Warren Wussner, Monique Purdock, and Janet Embertson. And with that, I'll hand things over to our speakers. Good morning, and thank you for spending some time with us today. It seems that you can't turn on the TV or the radio or read a newspaper without encountering something about COVID-19. And more recently, and interestingly, news about progress in developing a vaccine to this virus. So it felt like a perfect time to discuss patenting vaccines. I'm going to start with a brief discussion on vaccines, and then we'll move into the patenting discussion. Next slide, please. Um, so when we first heard about this new coronavirus um, earlier this year, and perhaps late last year, uh, we realized that um, well, one, it's a coronavirus, and two, that it's an RNA virus. So one of the questions that I had were, are there any RNA uh, vaccines against RNA viruses? One that comes to mind right away is HIV, which is an RNA virus. Um, and it's been around for decades, but currently there is no um, effective vaccine against this RNA virus. Another one, which was identified in 2003, it's, it's a coronavirus as well, so the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, there also is no vaccine to that RNA virus. Um, however, polio, which is an RNA virus, um, there are a couple of vaccines to that. Um, the United States uses an inactivated or killed vaccine, and other countries use a live attenuated vaccine. In the next couple of slides, we'll discuss the difference between those two. Another RNA virus that we do have a vaccine against is um, influenza, the flu virus. Um, there are two vaccines for that one. One's intramuscular, uh, it's injected, it's inactivated or killed. And the nasal form of that is an attenuated, uh, it's a live attenuated vaccine. So let's get into a discussion of um, some of the um, most well-known types of vaccines. Um, so next slide, please. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, there um, are several different types of vaccines, including killed or inactivated vaccine and live attenuated vaccine. So when a killed or an inactivated vaccine, the virus is killed by chemicals or heat, and then the dead virus is introduced into the body. Even though it's dead, the immune system can still learn from its antigens, its proteins. It can learn how to fight a live virus upon a future encounter. And examples of a killed or an activated vaccine are the polio vaccine, the injectable version, hepatitis A, rabies, and the injectable version of the flu vaccine. Next slide, please. So for a live attenuated vaccine, the pathogen, the virus is weakened. Its asymptomatic form of the virus is introduced into the body. So it isn't contagious. It doesn't cause the disease or sickness. Um, but the immune system is still going to learn to recognize the antigens on that vaccine, its proteins, and so that it will learn how to fight it in the future if there is an encounter. Such examples of such vaccines include measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR, chickenpox, the nasal delivery form of the flu vaccine, and rotavirus. Another form of vaccines are called subunit vaccines. And in subunit vaccines, specific Proteins or carbohydrates are isolated from the virus of interest. And when they're injected into the immune system and, and when they're introduced into the body, the immune system recognizes those parts and starts to generate antibodies and will then be able to mount a, a fight against a future encounter with um, a live, vac a live uh, virus. So examples of subunit vaccines include hepatitis B and human, human papillomavirus, HPV. Next slide. So other viruses um, that don't necessarily have FDA-approved forms yet 
include DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines, and adenoviral vector vaccines. And the reason why I bring these up at this point is these types of vaccines are generating a lot of, um, a lot of discussion, especially in the news. Um, and we'll get to that at the end of the slide. So for DNA vaccines, generally a genetically engineered plasmid um, is injected and this into the body. And this plasmid contains a DNA sequence that codes for one or more viral antigens or proteins that teach the immune system to recognize and react to the virus um, and generate antibodies that if it ever sees a live virus. There is one DNA um, approved virus against, one DNA approved virus um, that is approved. It's the West, it's a vaccine, or sorry, one DNA, one approved vaccine. It's the West Nile virus vaccine. I believe that's only for veterinary use at this point. Um, another vaccine are RNA vaccines um, it's very similar to DNA vaccines in that, um, unlike DNA, though, you're injecting RNA and that code for antigens, proteins that the immune system will then recognize and be able to uh, mount an attack on a viral particle having those antigens. An adenoviral vector vaccine um, it is is more of a platform, it's a delivery. It's, it's very similar to DNA vaccines and that you have a weakened adenovirus that is then genetically altered to carry um, other genetic material coding for antigens um, such as COVID-19 antigens that when introduced to the body, the immune system will recognize, recognize those antigens and be taught to fight against that um, particular virus of those, for those antigens. The reason why I bring this up at this time is DNA, RNA, and adenoviral vector vaccines are, are showing up in the news a lot because there is some pre-clinical uh, data as well as some very initial but very promising clinical data of companies that are developing vaccines. So Innovio Pharmaceuticals has a DNA vaccine that's showing some promise. Moderna has an RNA vaccine that is showing some pr promise. And Oxford is developing an adenoviral vector vaccine that is also showing some promise. I note that there appear from reports to be over 100 vaccines in development. Um, and there also appear to be probably about less than 10 right now that have reached some sort of clinical uh, data level. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Warren Wisner, who is now going to talk about patent eligibility and Section 101. Yes, hello. Thank you, Monique. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I, I thought I would do a quick look at the state of the law of patent eligibility, not be too detailed, just because, not, not even citing cases, because, of course, I assume that you all are familiar with, this, with the case law in uh, Section 101, patent eligibility. Um, in Myriad, the Supreme Court held that isolated human genomic DNA is a natural product and so is not patentable, even if it's been, you know, cut out of the entirety of the genome, human genome. Um, they, they, they reason that it's information providing properties, it's coding properties, um, rendered it a natural product even after it was isolated. And uh, um, single-stranded DNA was found to be not patentable, not patent eligible by the Federal Circuit, and that would include primers used for uh, the polymerase chain reaction. Um, in Myriad, though, the Supreme Court went out of their way to say that cDNA is patentable, and at least if the introns are removed, so we don't, so the cDNA is different in sequence from the um, iso entire, entire isolated human gene. Um, and the Federal Circuit has also found that naturally occurring polypeptides per se are also natural products. Actually, I shouldn't say that because I don't know the case that says that. I think the Patent Office has sort of uh, taken this position uh, to broaden the uh, reach of, of materials that are not patent eligible. Um, uh, on another tack, simple, right now, simple if A then B diagnostic claims are not patent eligible. 
That's a claim like high homocysteine levels in the blood indicate cobalamin deficiency or high PSA indicates increased risk of prostate cancer. Um, they are, that's because they're considered uh, by the court, particularly by the Federal Circuit now, to simply be the identification of a naturally occurring correlation. Even though it, has not, it was unknown before and even though the vaccine, uh, the diagnostic is of great value, it's, it's still considered to be that kind of simple diagnostic is considered to be a natural phenomenon. Now it's possible that altered reagents that are used in diagnostic tests, say you have a capture antigen like musk, uh, which is a circulating protein, and you, you label it with a radio label, that might be patent eligible since it's a new compound and the hand of man has contributed to its development. And what's very important, of course, to this uh, talk is that methods of medical treatment such as vaccination are patentable uh, even if the claims recite a diagnostic step like determining that a patient has biomarker X at a certain level and then treating it with, treating it with Y um, or, or simple vaccination prophylactic uh, medical treatments. Next slide. The PTO guidance, um, the, the most germane PTO guidance is in the May 2016 uh, materials that were circulated, have been widely circulated. And example 28, um, they get right into it. Um, and claim three is to a vaccine comprising peptide F and a pharmaceutically acceptable carrier. And they set they set the rules for their analysis, and they say, in this case, peptide F is a natural product, so it's not, per se, patent eligible. Um, the patent office and the courts would agree that uh, claim three is not eligible for patenting. A peptide plus, remember, a carrier it could be anything, and that would include water. And since this peptide does naturally occur in combination with water, it's now a natural product. And so the answer is, yes, the claim is directed to a natural product um, in step 2A of the Mayo Alice eligibility uh, requirements test. Next slide, please. Um, now claim four of that same example, hypothetical example, is a vaccine comprising peptide F and a pharmaceutically acceptable carrier selected from the group consisting of a cream, an emulsion, a gel, liposomes, nanoparticle, or an ointment. Um, patent Office guidance finds that this claim is eligible for patenting. Uh, the claim cream, that's because the claimed cream has, com in combination with the vaccine, with the peptide, has markedly different structural and physical characteristics than its naturally occurring counterparts. Um, markedly the markedly different test sort of stands outside in some ways of the Alice Mayo test. And, uh, but, it, but it's taken uh, from directly from the Chakabarty decision where the Supreme Court said that the transformed bacteria developed by Chakabarty was markedly different than anything uh, that occurred in nature, including the untransformed bacterium. And then claim five recited in the hypothetical claim recites peptide A plus an aluminum salt adjuvant. That was found to be patent eligible also. Remember, these may be obvious, later found obvious or anticipated, but they, they are patent eligible. They don't exist in nature, and the combination imparts markedly different properties to peptide F vaccine. Next slide. Yeah, the Mayo Alice rule is not well suited to the natural products exception to patentability, judicial exception. Um, if you, you should write down, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but on MPEP section 2106, there is a patent subject matter eligibility chart as steps 2A and B. There's little guidance on analyzing compositions that are mixtures of natural products or mixtures of natural products with non-natural products. Uh, despite the PTO's own guidelines. 
uh, this rather uh, complex section 210604C1A says if a claim to a natural is to a natural product itself, the markedly different character analysis should be applied to the entire product, um, not just to the natural product. Um, patentable, I mentioned Chakabarty. Um, a product made by combining multiple natural products, the, the analysis should be applied to the nature-based composition, to the mixture, not to its component parts one at a time. And non-nature-based element, non-nature-based elements like packaging or dosage forms, uh, timed release forms, are considered under step 2C of the conventional routine and well understood analysis. You don't want to go there. So if you have a natural product, um, such as a peptide or a stretch of RNA and DNA, um, that's, ah, in comp that's, that's pat that you can find a reason why it's patent eligible before you get to this step in the analysis where the court is going to look at um, every, every other thing that you've combined uh, that is conventional with your vaccine in terms of the carrier, the adjuvant, the, as I said, the packaging and dosage forms, you're, you're in trouble at that point. So next slide, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this section of the MPEP comes a bit later. It muddies the waters, I think. It says when a nature-based product is a combination produced from multiple components, the closest counterpart may be the individual components of the combination. Well, instead of looking at the invention, the claim evaluation as a whole, it looks like they can break out different natural products from a mixture and see if um, those products, um, well, if the combination is markedly different from a single product, well, you think it would be, but this is an attempt to shoehorn the Funk Brothers, very controversial Funk Brothers Seed Company case into the 2A analysis. Uh, in other words, you're trying to determine if what is the claims are directed to a natural product, not just recite a natural product. Uh, because there's no, and they said, because there is no counterpart mixture in nature, the closest counterparts to the claim mixture are the individual components of the mixture. Well, suddenly what happened to the claim evaluation uh, the black letter law that a claim should be evaluated for patent eligibility read as a whole. And if that were the, tr the case, the bacterial, bacterial inoculant mixture in Funk Brothers would have been patent eligible. Next slide. Well, are killed viruses patent eligible? Hmm. Um, Maybe not. Without more, more, a dead virus is just a dead virus, and it's probably not eligible for patenting. I mean, it may have markedly different characteristics than a live virus, but there are dead viruses in floating around in nature. But maybe yes, if you've, inact if you've inactivated the viruses uh, uh, by chemical modification so that it is not infective, say, uh, with formalin with a chemical inactivation, um, that may uh, impart changes to the virus, uh, the genome of the virus or its coat, coating. Um, again, the added, any added ingredients to the, uh, as we discussed above, it should be dealt with in terms of the uh, patent office's examples, hypotheticals, of course the court too. But if you have added ingredients, they must yield markedly different compositions. Uh, to your dead virus vaccine. Next slide. Hmm. Are attenuated viruses patent eligible? Um, these are made by usually passaging the uh, virus or other bacterial antigen, bacterial infective agent through a number of, of, of non-typical hosts like a hamster, for instance, in the case of a uh, killed bacteria or a live bacteria that causes Lyme disease. But if mutations have been introduced and you're passaging it to introduce mutations and you isolate it after you 
passaged it through, cultivated it through these host animals. If you take it out, out of there, well, the virus is now no longer the natural product. You've introduced purposefully some mutations. Of course, the problem is, do you know what structural changes are induced by this process of attenuation, multi-culturing process? And uh, Rob and Chadwick will talk about, a bit about that later. The next slide. Yeah, are recombinant expression vectors eligible? Um, it's expression vectors comprising immunogenic proteins are unnatural and probably patent eligible. Um, let's look at an expression vector comprising a promoter. It could be, you know, a bacterial promoter. It's operably linked to a heterologous nucleic acid segment. Or it's one that is not normally associated with that promoter and, and say with that terminator. Um, operably linked to a heterologous nucleic acid segment encoding a coronavirus spike protein with at least 95% sequence identity to seek ID uh, number one. So you're now making yourself a vaccine um, by uh, expressing uh, the gene for it uh, for the heterologous protein uh, for the coronavirus spike protein from a system such as a plasmid. And then you might, um, you might isolate that protein um, and use it as a vaccine. The Ebola virus vaccine is a live attenuated uh, VSV, that's a vaccine that causes colds. Uh, live, well, that's adenovirus, but VSV V does pretty much the same thing. It's a pretty mild virus and you can attenuate it so its infectivity is still there, but it doesn't cause harmful effects. So you, you can design a vaccine that expresses an Ebola glycoprotein and would cause a strong immune response. And I've given an example of a patent. You can look at about that kind of vaccine. The next slide. Now I'm going to turn this over to Robin Chadwick, and she's going to discuss the written description requirement, always a, a challenge in biotech. Yes, while the written description, while the eligibility requirements may determine whether you can patent something at all, the written description requirement is often used as a tool to define the boundaries of the claims that you get in your patent. Some would say, in fact, that the written description requirement is a tool to restrict the scope of your claims, possibly even to the point where they're no, no longer commercially useful. But be that as it may, the written description requirement has basically sort of two aspects. One is that a patent must describe the technology sought to be determined, sought to be patented. And typically what this means is that you must define the structure of your invention physically. So what is the physical structure of your invention? And then another aspect of the written description requirement is that you must demonstrate that the patentee was in possession of the invention that is claimed. And this often means that um, you must demonstrate that, experimentally demonstrate that the invention works as you say it does. So this often means, uh, this often comes down to whether there are enough working examples in your patent application. Next slide. So let's look at an example where we might have written description problems. Now, Warren talked a little bit and so did Monique about attenuated viruses. So here we have a hypothetical claim drawn to a stabilized live vaccine comprising an attenuated live varicella zoster virus, this is the chicken pox virus, with a stabilizer that comprises sucrose or lactose. The specification in this case indicates that the varicella zoster virus is passaged more than five, five or more times through guinea pig embryonic um, tissue cells until it is non-replicating. So is there a written description problem? Next slide, please. Probably yes. If, so how would you fix this problem if there is one? If the structural changes that are present in the attenuated virus are defined in the application, 
then you can probably add those structural changes to the claim and you may be able to patent that claim. If you do not define any structural changes for the attenuated virus, you might have a problem. Next slide. Another way to fix the problem is to make a deposit of your attenuated virus. So let's say you're approaching, you know, some potential disclosure of the virus or you want to get your, your um, patent application on file, but you don't know what caused the attenuation of the, the virus to make it into a vaccine. So what you can do is you can initiate deposit of the vaccine um, with a recognized cell depository. Unfortunately, you need to provide a number of vials, for example, maybe 25 vials to the ATCC. And so this may take some time, but what you can do, at least in the U.S., is put sort of a skeletal structure within your patent application defining where you're going to deposit it, you know, what the address of the depository is, you know, um, and then leave sort of a blank place space for the actual deposit information and when it is deposited. At least in the United States, you can add that deposit information. This is not true in other countries. For example, Europe will probably require you to have the deposit information in your patent application or you will but not be accorded a um, priority filing date. Next slide. So let's look at, we, we remember we, we talked about the written description requirement is, is requiring structural information. So this is an example where we have a hypothetical claim, a patent comprising a 7 to 40 amino acid surface antigen from an infectious agent and a human universal epitope. So there's sort of two structural aspects to this peptide. Um, what might happen here is that the patent office would tell you that you fail to show structures of all of the infectious agent antigens that you could possibly use and of all of the universal epitope sequences or structures that you could possibly use. So what you might do then is look around in your patent application and see what information you could use that you could import into your patent claim to save the claim. And one thing that you might consider is defining just one of the structure elements. The human universal epitope, there may not be that many sequences for it, that many, you know, structures for it. So you might use the structure of one of those human universal epitopes, which is defined by seq ID number 11, and you might use that information in your claim to save the claim. Now, you've still left open the possibility of using any, you know, seven to any um, surface antigen with this human universal epitope. So you still have some scope to your claim. Next, next slide, please. So the other aspect of the written description requirement is possession. Now that looks more like providing experimental information indicating that you actually, you know, that the invention actually works as you say it does. So here we have a claim, a hypothetical claim drawn to a multivalent poultry vaccine consisting essentially of a recombinant herpes virus vector containing a Newcastle disease virus HN gene. Now the patent office might reject this claim saying that while the specification provides examples of using turkey herpes virus as, as a vector, it does not show possession of all herpes viruses as vectors. So the way to cure that that problem is to then define what type of herpes virus vector you're using by just inserting the word turkey into your claim. And that may solve your, at least the possession side of the um, written description rejection. And as I said, this looks a bit like enablement. So let's turn to enablement. Next slide, please. Under the enablement requirement, you have to define or describe how to make and use your invention. Next slide. So let's look at one of the major problems, the major enablement problems that we face with vaccines. And the, the problem is basically with the term vaccine. The patent office basically interprets the word vaccine as requiring applicants to show clinical data demonstrating that your composition actually blocks or, you know, um, prevents disease. So here, for example, we have a claim 
a vaccine for generating an immune response to an individual against dengue virus, comprising an expression vector, etc. The problem here, the patent office might say, is while being enabling for generating an immune response, the specification does not reasonably provide enablement of a vaccine that prevents disease. And so um, you might just change the wording in your claim to say, instead of a vaccine, you say a composition. And in some ways, this is a broader claim. So it's a better claim. However, um, you, may, you may try later to get even narrower claims to just the specific vaccine composition that you want to patent in the same application by refiling it. Once you do have clinical data, you could submit those data and then maybe get an additional patent. Next slide. All right, so now here we, um, we talked a little bit about how um, written description looks like enablement and vice versa. And so here we have um, sort of structural information saving an enablement problem. Our, our hypothetical example is an isolated recombinant coronavirus having a genome modified to express an S protein with a residue other than glycine at position 150 in the S protein protease cleavage site. So the specification teaches us that cleavage makes this coronavirus a better vaccine. The problem with enablement is that the specification only enables two amino acids as allowing cleavage of the S protein. So we may have to actually list those two amino acids in our claim rather than just, you know, directing the claim to any residue other than glycine. So that would save this, this enablement problem. Next slide. So um, let's look at some actual examples provided by the patent office. And here, if you click on the link at the bottom here, you'll see some of these examples. I've played with the language of the claims just to make them a little bit simpler to see. But here, for example, O, we have a peptide having the following sequence. Now, as we heard from Warren, this peptide probably would not be eligible for patenting. But when we're considering enablement, it's not a problem. So in other words, this would pass the enablement bar, even if it wouldn't pass the patent eligibility bar. Because the reason it would pass enablement is that the specification does teach how to make the peptide. The specification does show how to use the peptide to make antibodies for various types of assays. Next slide. So here we have a method of treating. This is our, our hypothetical claim. A method of treating a subject with, with erythrosis by administering the peptide of claim one to the host, to a host. I should say a subject here. Um, erythosis, um, according to this patent office example, um, leads to lysis of erythrocytes. So it's a disease that um, relates to that. It's a hypothetical disease. According to the patent office, um, and this exam, this enable, this would incite an enablement rejection because while the specification enables a method for treating antibodies, it does not enable treatment of a disease. So you can then maybe amend your, um, your method of treatment claim to, to a method of producing antibodies that recognize this bacterium. And, um, and that would potentially solve the problem. And again, this, this actually makes the claim a little bit broader possibly, because now you merely need to produce antibodies rather than actually treat the disease. Next slide. All right, we talked about looking back, and this is my effort to look back a little bit. So here we have a 1993 case, In Ray Wright. And again, I've taken the claim from it. It's, the claim has been shortened a bit. But here is my example claim 11. A live non-pathogenic vaccine for a pathogenic RNA virus comprising a construct comprising an antigenic determinant region of the RNA virus where the vaccine has no pathogenic properties. The wording was even more awkward than I put here in the original claim. The problem with this from an enablement perspective is that the spe specification only provides one example of this modified pathogenic RNA virus, and it is a modified prog avian sarcoma virus, where 
only the R the R A V A C N viral strain um, was was useful as a vaccine, and that strain had a modified envelope A gene, and so the the patent applicants were forced to insert the name of the strain, the R A V A C N strain, into the claim in order to get patent patent claims. So let's look at the next slide and. Next slide. Um, so based upon sort of the facts that we know this about this RAVAC strain, could we, if we were clever when we were originally writing the patent application, what could we do to maybe get claims to another type of RNA vaccine? If we know what the structural changes are to the, the envelope A gene in the RAVACN strain, we could maybe look for other RNA viruses that also have envelope A proteins. We could define the structure of all of the en envelope A proteins from various RNA viruses. We could define the structural changes needed based upon our knowledge of the RAVACN strain um, that would be needed to make an RNA vaccine. And we could recite those structural changes in our patent application. And then later show data indicating that another, a second RNA viral strain can actually cause an immune response in a host. And so that way you might be able to get claims to another RNA vaccine or another immunological composition that would be useful against a pathogenic RNA virus. So sometimes you can solve enablement problems, but it often takes working very closely with your client to be able to predict which RNA viruses you want to target and be able to sort of define which sort of structural changes may be needed. And next slide. So some, some problems can be solved and we would like to thank you for your interest. And if you have any questions, please provide them for us. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, Bray, are you able to see if there's any questions in a minute? I don't see any under Q&A. It, it looks as though we've answered all the questions <laughs> that may be uh, out there. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Oh, it looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, someone is asking, will the slides be available? Yes, they certainly will, and we'll be happy to email those out to everyone. And someone said, thank you, very clear information. And it looks like we also have a chat coming in. And, um, and someone was just wondering if the recording will be available later, um, and it certainly will, and we'll be happy to email that out to everyone. Well, if there are no more, let's see, maybe a couple other, you know what, just the same questions. Well, thank you again, everyone, for attending. And um, have a great day and be well. Thank you so much. <laughs>